Glad that you're here with us this morning as we worship our God together. Thankful for your attendance, thankful for your devotion, and it's always good to be assembled with brothers and sisters in Christ. We're thankful for that. And uh, before I get underway, let's uh, go to God in prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for your word. And as we consider your word, we understand that your son Jesus, our Savior, was called the word, the Lagos. That he came to show the world what you are like. And that he came to explain who you were. But then, Father, we know that the word, who is Jesus, also gave us a word, teaching, we call the gospel. And Father, we're so thankful for the word of Christ, whether it be Christ himself or his word that he has provided for us through the scriptures. And Father, we're thankful for both. We know without the one there is not the other. And Father, we thank you for the scriptures that you have provided we know that you have told us in your own word that your word is living and powerful, that your word is life-giving, that your word is faith-giving, and that your word is life-changing. Lord, we ask that you would help us all to hunger and thirst for righteousness and for truth. And as we study this morning, Father, we pray that our hearts and minds who are assembled here today be filled with the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And Father, while the world emphasizes the birth of Christ at this time, today and every Sunday, Every first day of the week, Father, you have desired for us to remember his death until he comes. For we know that Jesus was indeed born in order to die for our sins. And not only for our sins, but the sins of the entire world. And he had to do so on a cruel cross of Calvary. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. And we thank you, Father, for always being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you can see, our title of our lesson this morning is Gift Wrapped. And I don't know about you, but you get a nice present for somebody, then you always want to kind of make it more special, and you want to make it look nice and presentable. And so you buy the pretty wrapping paper, and you put it in the, the wrapping paper, but if you're like me, you just give the store-bought bag to the person with the item in it because I cannot wrap presents to save my life. Of course, they do make those bags now that you can put them in a bag, and I suppose I could break down and buy those, but what's the point? <laughs> we'll just give them the gift from the store-bought bag. But it is a time where we can be with our family, that we can share with our family and friends, and, uh, and so that's always, always a good time when we can be with uh, our family and friends at this time of year. And it's the time of expressing love. It's the time of expressing kindness toward others. You know, the, the Christmas season, as it's called, first you have Christmas Day, and then there's Christmas season, and then you go back into history and you learn that there's 12 days of Christmas. But that wasn't good enough, so he needed... Uh, 30 days of Christmas, you know, from the point of Thanksgiving onward. And then now you have 90 days out, 120 days out. Now Christmas is beginning in July, as you can see from all the TV shows on QVC and HSN, where they have Christmas in July. But we learn because 
Christmas has become so commercialized, right? It's no longer the idea of Jesus, but it is about presents and it is about spending money on others. And it's about spending the amount of money on the right gift to give to that individual. And so indeed has become commercialized. But as we consider the idea of Christmas, Elvis once said, why can't every day be like Christmas? Why can't this feeling go on endlessly? For if every day could be like Christmas, what a wonderful world this would be. And that's true. But unfortunately, it's not just about December 25th, and it's not about the time period between Thanksgiving and the 25th, and it's not about from September to December, and it's not from July to December, and it's not from January to January, but it's every day of every year God desires that day to be a Christmas day. He desires us to show Jesus Christ to the world every day. And he desires us to show love. We are to love God and love others, not just on a Christmas day, not just in a Christmas season, not just in a particular period of time, but every day, every day. And so we are to give of ourselves, not just monetarily, but of ourselves to others. Every day we are to consider others better than ourselves. That's called humility. Every day we humble ourselves before God. You're better than me. That's the attitude that we are to have toward others. And of course, Elvis had it right. It's not just a one-way street. It's a two-way street. And so we wish there was some reciprocation there and the world would be better off. And so it is our responsibility to teach others the way to have that reciprocity, the way to have that two-way street. Because the only way folks are going to know it is when they submit to Christ. That's the only way we know it, and that's the only way they're going to know it. And so we have to bring them Jesus Christ. And not only through teaching, but also in our example in our daily lives. People need to see who we are as children of God and as followers of Jesus Christ. But regarding the idea of Christmas being commercialized and so forth, and about make a buck, make a buck, well, I'm going to share here a, a film clip from one of my favorite movies, Miracle on 34th Street. Imagine, making a child take something it doesn't want just because he bought too many of the wrong toys. That's what I've been fighting against for years, the way they commercialize Christmas. Yeah, there's a lot of bad isms floating around this world, but one of the worst is commercialism. Make a buck, make a buck. Even in Brooklyn, it's the same. Don't care what Christmas stands for. Just make a buck, make a buck. <laughs> oh, don't fire off for the way with you. Huh? Oh, thank you, Alfred. And what should I do with these? Throw them on a floor. I get kind of tired just sweeping up dust. Uh -huh. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Make a buck, make a buck. That's what it turns into. You know, that's the way religion has gone, and it's not new. We can see in the day of Christ, when Jesus went to the temple, what had happened? The religion of God had turned into a money-making scheme in the temple. And so Jesus had to go over and turn out all over the tables and the money changers and show them that this was a, a, a den of thieves rather than the house of God in a prayer. And so religion along the way has been corrupted. And the thought of Jesus has also been corrupted. And that we take the idea or the concept of the birth of Christ and turn it into a money-making Ponzi scheme, if you will, and about how we spend our money. And so we're, as we're talking about gift wrap, what we're talking about is the birth of Christ that was wrapped in promise. The birth of Christ that was wrapped in scandal and the birth of Christ that was wrapped in love. And so as we think about wrapped in promise, 
You can't help but think of going back to the book of Genesis where God intervenes and begins speaking to the serpent, the devil. And uh, he says, he says, but I will put enmity between you and the woman, Eve, between her seed, her lineage, and your seed. And he shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so right there is the first messianic prophecy. The promise of a coming Messiah whereby he would be victorious over death, over sin, over Satan. And then we think about Isaiah chapter 9 in prophecy. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulders. And we shall call his name Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. And his government shall know no bounds, but increase unto everlasting. And so we find here those prophecies in the Old Testament. There's over 300 of those kind of prophecies found in the Old Testament, pointing to Jesus, pointing to his coming day. And then, of course, we come into the, the golden text of the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, a lot of people look at that verse and they think it's a one-time deal. Whoever believes in him once is saved. It's not. That is in the present tense and it means continuous action. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever continues believing in him shall not perish but continue having everlasting life. Continue having everlasting life is conditioned upon continue believing in the son of God, in Jesus Christ. And so God would send forth his son. But when? When would God send forth his son? Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin or a woman, born under the law. So that was at that appropriate time. Now you think about the history of the time. You have the first messianic prophecy in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Jesus is coming. And then God makes a covenant with Abraham and says, through your seed shall come the Messiah and he will deliver his people. And then to Isaac, he says, the same seed promise given to Abraham is given to you. From your seed shall come the Messiah. And then God, through Nathan, tells David that through his seed, the Messiah will come. And so we go through all of that Old Testament history up until the rebuilding of the new temple and the coming of John the Baptist, who would be the Elijah of old, who would prepare the way of the Messiah. And so we come into the new covenant, the new Testament. And then at the appropriate time, at the right time, or as the Holy Spirit says, at the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman born under the law. God chose the specific time in history for this to occur. And we find, therefore, that this gift, the greatest gift that you could ever have in your lifetime, the gift of life, the gift of grace, but all of that's the gift of Jesus Christ. And it was given to us at the exact moment in time that the Father wanted to give it. And so we find here that the birth of Christ was wrapped in promise. Wrapped in promise. But also we learn that this gift was wrapped in scandal. In scandal. You know, one of the two of the biggest things about Jesus Christ that cause people to be atheists are one, his incarnation, and two, his crucifixion. Because those people who have uh, secular religions, 
like, and I'm using secular religions in the sense that they don't believe in Jesus Christ, but they call themselves a church or a religion. Now, those people find it reprehensible that God could be wounded. Think about that. God could be wounded. How could God be wounded? How could God become flesh? How could God become, uh, through the, the birth canal of a human being, be born in the flesh? How demeaning. How scandalous. Because that's not majesty. That's not the God that they understand. But God mourned for his people. God mourned for his creation. And therefore at his heart was wounded. And in his devotion and hurt, there was a plan devised to send Jesus to die for you and for me. And for the entire world. And so God was wounded in the heart. But also when God became flesh. He also had to be wounded. Physically. He had to be beaten to a pulp. He had to suffer. Physical suffering. None of us want physical suffering. None of us want to die. Watching gun smoke yesterday. And I don't know how many gun smoke stories show some guy who's at the other end of a gun and he doesn't want to die. No, no, don't kill me. Don't kill me. And then the bad guy goes, Pow! kills him dead. Think about Jesus. Wasn't he like that? Wasn't he like that when he was in the garden of Gethsemane? When he was praying and dripping down were sweat like blood. And now he said, father, father. Is there any way for you to take this cup from me? Is there any other way that it could be done? Can you, can you send me this way and not that way? Well, he knew the answer. And he had to follow through with the plan. So Jesus, once again, in a scandalous way, was born to die. And again, I said before that people make an attempt to disbelieve God or the Christian's God and an attempt to disbelieve in Jesus based upon the incarnation. Muslims find that reprehensible, that God would leave his majesty in order to become one of us. That's exactly what God did. God moved to our neighborhood. Right? We couldn't go to his neighborhood, so he had to come to ours. And so in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And without him, everything that was made would not have been made. But he created everything. Jesus God. And then it says in verse 14 of the same chapter. And he became flesh and dwelt among us. He became one of us. He had to endure our life's struggles in order for him to understand fully what it was to be human. He had to experience it. And yet, while experiencing his life as a human being in the flesh, he doesn't sin. Completely sinless. And he did that for you and for me. And so, the birth of Christ in Christianity is the only, only religion in the entire world whereby God became man. For God became man. In every other religion, it's always about God or about man trying to reach God. In Christianity, it's about God reaching man. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's the purpose of his coming. And that was upon the establishment of his birth. Because of his birth, he was able to do that. And so God live like us. And so another uh, monkey wrench thrown into the, into the machine, I guess, some people would say, is that, well, what you're doing is you're lowering Jesus uh, and his majesty and his lordship and his kingship to a human level. Yes. We're not doing that. We're explaining 
what God did. God did become human. He did become flesh. He did become one of us. He did have to eat. He did have to sleep. And guess what? Here's a dirty little secret. A dirty little scandalous secret. Jesus had to go to the bathroom. He was one of us. He lived like you and me. A lot of us don't like to think about that because we don't want to make it uh, seem uh, less dignified than it is. But that that's the truth. Because he was human, he lived like one of us, having to do so. And so God did more. God did give up his majesty to become one of us. He left his home in glory. Willingly. He left his home in glory to come to this earth to become flesh. And then he came to this cesspool of a world. He came to our neighborhood. Just think about what that would have done to you and me. You left your mansion. Just picture yourself like a billionaire. And you're living in this gold-plated mansion. And you have everything at your fingertips. And all of a sudden, you have to come to our neighborhood. That's what Jesus did. And Jesus was willing to do so. And so... He is the one that brings about the idea of scandal through his birth. But as you think about the scandal associated with not only his birth, but the cross and everything in between, we think about this, Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary. Now, just picture yourself as Mary. You're betrothed. You're not yet married, but you're betrothed. In the betrothal period, there's a year until the marriage date. And so during this time frame, she begins to show this baby bump. And she begins to walk around. And people begin to notice. And people begin to start calling her names. What's going on here? Scandal, perhaps. Now, good old Joseph, he knew what was going on. And... You know, for one to be in such a situation would have been punishment by death, punishment by stoning. But Joseph loved Mary, and he protected her. He could have come out and said she's guilty of this and that, but he didn't. But just think about Joseph now having to go through this. What do I do? She's been unfaithful to me. What am I going to do next? And then all of a sudden, a voice from heaven. Don't worry, Joseph. Mary has been overshadowed by the Holy One of God. Could you imagine the relief in his heart? Because he's avoided the scandal. But as we think about the scandal, I want us to th turn to John chapter 8, if you would. The old-fashioned way, take out the Bible in front of you and turn over to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Are you at chapter 8? We'll start in verse... Uh, Verse 34. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. That's something deep to think about. Slave doesn't live in a house forever. What's he saying? He's saying a child of God does not sin. But if a child of God finds themselves in sin and living in sin. He's no longer a child, but a slave. He's attached himself, has become uh, a servant to that which separates him from God. And so he says, whoever keeps on committing sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. 
Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen, uh, what I have uh, seen with my father, and you do what you have, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. Well, what are they saying? Well, the rumor's out about Jesus. They're talking to Jesus. And they turned to him and said, well, we're not like you. You're a born in fornication. See how the scandal was perpetuating? Mary's reputation was tainted. Joseph was laughed at. And Jesus was scorned and ascribed things that did not belong to him. And so it was that when Jesus came to this earth to be born of a virgin at the exact time God wanted him to be born, it was brought in promise and it was brought in scandal. And it was scandal all the way up until Jesus' time upon the cross. And also as we think about the idea of Jesus coming and being born, that gift was wrapped in love. You know, you think about the manger scene, right? You can look at, you can think of all the movies that you've ever seen in the, your past, or you can think about the peanuts. And, uh, and you think about Jesus in that manger. Do you know what a manger is? It's not a barn. It's a feeding trough. That's a manger. Now, the feeding trough was in a barn. And uh, so what they did was, in this little feeding trough, like a V, they put the hay. And the cattle would come over and they'd eat out of that feeding trough, that, that manger. Well, evidently the cattle were no longer feeding. There was hay still in the feeding trough. And they put the baby in the manger, in that crib. And also, when you think about the baby in the manger, that's the logos. That's the word of God. And Jesus tells his people over and over again, that they are to eat of the bread of life, that they are to eat his body, eat his flesh. And what he was saying was, you are to eat what I'm teaching you. You are to digest it. You are to fill yourself with what I'm telling you. Now, isn't it appropriate that the word is in a feeding trough? And then to think about how the baby was wrapped in that manger. The Bible tells us that he was wrapped in swaddling cloths. You know what that is? Milk rags. You ever milk a cow? They use those rags as they pull the udders. And there's milk and stuff all over the rags. Well, you're to desire the sincere milk of the Lagos, the word. All these imageries, all these different types of imageries play a role for us. As the scene unfolds and it points to Jesus. You think about the Old Testament. How every sign, every shadow, every example points in the direction of Jesus Christ. And even as you get into the New Testament. You have signs and examples that point to a better understanding of who this Jesus is. Who this Messiah is. The word, the Lagos who came to dwell among us. And so we find here some interesting things concerning the birth of Christ, but wrapped in love, wrapped in love, for God so loved the world that he gave us a son at the exact moment in time. And Jesus comes in and he says, what I want to do is I want to wrap you in my love and I want to wrap you in my grace. And I want to deliver you to my father. 
And that will be my present for him. The Bible tells us that he's going to come back for us. And that he's going to take us to his home on high called heaven. And there he will deliver the kingdom back to the father. He's going to have it wrapped in his blood. He's going to have it wrapped in his love. And the father is going to accept the present. You're the present. Wrapped in a pretty bow of grace. You think about this wonderful time of year and you think about the birth of Christ. It's significant. But Jesus said this. He said, because of what I've done for you, here's what you need to do for me. This is after his death. He's given instruction not only to his apostles, but to the entire world. He says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's grace. That's love extended. That's grace extended. And he's saying, listen, it's not about you doing things. It's about you just accepting the conditions I have placed upon my blood. You can't get to the blood unless you accept the conditions he's offered. And he says, he that believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ and is baptized shall be saved. A promise and a point of fact. And of course, we learn later that Peter would tell the throng of people assembled on the day of Pentecost, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And so we find here that immersion in water stands before the remission of sins and grace, that it's a condition attached. It has nothing to do with earning anything. It has nothing to do with working anything. It's just simply a condition of love. A condition that we say, okay, I accept it. Now, some of you may need that. Some of you may need that present that's wrapped in the words of Jesus. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You can do that today if you like. There might be others here who have done that. But perhaps the gift that you've accepted kind of is tarnished now. The paper's all wrinkled up, a little dirty. And Jesus says, just all it needs is a little polishing, a little straightening up. We call that repentance. If that's your desire this morning, why don't you come forward as together we stand and sing.